Good evening, Your Royal Highnesses, Your Excellency, Lords and Ladies, everyone. Um, I'm Javor Wilder and I'm the director of the Josephine Hart Poetry Foundation and I'd like to welcome you for this wonderful summer evening uh, reading in the garden. And um, I want to tell you a little bit about Josephine's thinking behind the poetry hours. It's something she wrote. Um, so uh, she wrote that um, she believed a public performance of the great poetry of the dead poets read by great actors should be the norm in London. The philosophy behind her poetry hours can be expressed in three parts. First, the life of the poet. Josephine agreed with T.S. Eliot that we understand the work better if we understand something of the poet's life. Eliot said, the poet always writes out of his personal life and in his finest work out of its tragedy, whatever it may be, remorse, lost love or loneliness. Therefore, Josephine's introductions to the poets are always an important part of these evenings. All of her introductions to the great poets were published by in three volumes, and they were sent free of charge to all secondary schools in England. Second, the poets read aloud. According to Hart, poetry startles us into a more full sense of life. It is a trinity of sound, sense, and sensibility. And the sense of sound, what Robert Frost called the sound of sense, will be lost unless we hear it. Language caught alive. The gold in the oar is the sound. Seamus Heaney, as an undergraduate at Queen's, found hearing Eliot's four quartets, read by the actor Robert Spate, um, that what had been perplexing when sight read for meaning only was hypnotic when read aloud. And Yeats, in his 70s, said he'd spent his life clearing out of poetry every phrase written for the eye alone and bringing all back to syntax, that is, for the ear. Auden put it more bluntly. No poem, which is not better heard than read, is good poetry. And third, poetry read aloud by great actors. Again, Josephine Hart agrees with T.S. Eliot that poetry should be read to us by skilled readers, the feeling for syllable and rhythm penetrating far below the conscious level of thought and feeling, invigorating every word. And now I will give you a short introduction to our wonderful cast this evening before I hand over to them to read the poems. Um, Sinead Cusack, who most of you know, um, began her career at the Abbey Theatre in Dublin and became a stalwart of the Royal Shakespeare Company where she played many leading roles. Her awards for Best Actress include Irish Times Theatre Award, Clarence Derwent Award, Evening Standard and Critics Circle Awards, <laughs> and multiple Olivier and Tony Award nominations. Um, so please welcome her. And by her side, Jeremy Irons, who trained at the Bristol Old Vic Theatre School and graduated to the Bristol Old Vic Company and then the Royal Shakespeare Company. His film and theatre credits and awards are legion and include the rare triple crown of an Oscar, an Emmy and a Tony Award. Um, a great connection to Josephine Hart is that Jeremy, of course, starred in the original film adaptation of Josephine Hart's Damage, directed by Louis Mal, 30 years ago now, I think. So that's Jeremy for us. <laughs> Sophie Cookson's breakout role was as Roxy in the Kingsman films. Her other credits are The Confessions of Franny Langton, The Trial of Christine Keeler, Red Joan, where she played the young Joan opposite Judy Dench's older Joan, and Dottie in Killer Joe opposite Orlando Bloom in The West End, which won her great critical acclaim. And next, Wilf Scolding, new to the Poetry Hour, is best known for his roles in Star Wars and or Game of Thrones and Fantastic Beasts, The Secrets of Dumbledore. He also plays a long-running character in The Archers for BBC Radio 4. <laughs> and then we come to Rish Shah who starred in the recent Netflix series Obsession, which is, of course, an adaptation of Josephine Hart's novel Damage. 
and he's also been in the Miss Marvel series recently. His stage appearances include Catcher in the Rye, Twelfth Night, Disappearing Number and East. Thank you all. Do enjoy the evening. Now, I'm standing in for Josephine Hart. It's an impossibility, but I, I will try and do her justice. But these are her introductions, so I speak as Josephine, uh, who is the most eloquent and elegant woman talking about poetry that I've ever come across. So this is the first introduction. The story of life, Oscar Wilde said, began with a man and a woman in a garden. He omitted to mention the serpent and thereby hangs a tale. <laughs> Every story should have a beginning, a middle and an end, though as one author remarked, not necessarily in that order. In that defiant spirit, we will end the reading at the beginning, in the Garden of Eden, which became Milton's and our Paradise Lost. From the moment that God created that garden, eastward of Eden, as the Bible tells us, and then ruthlessly threw us out of it, the garden here on earth became the plain man's real paradise. We play God when we create a garden, large or small, though, as those of us who are married to a gardener can testify, it takes a lot longer than the seven days in which God created the entire universe. <laughs> there is always work in progress. Perhaps the fascination in creating a garden lies in the metaphoric power of the garden, the budding, the flowering, the maturing, the withering, of springtime, summer, autumn and winter, reflecting the natural rhythms of life, the great dream of resurrection promised as spring follows winter, and as Larkin puts it, begin afresh, afresh, afresh. How could the writer resist? Poetic sensibility is particularly intense in the garden, and few poets, if any, have resisted, which made the selection and deconstruction of this evening challenging. Right from the beginning, the garden images are woven in through the poetic canon. Three of the greatest poems of all time did not open in palaces or within four walls, however humble. Dante famously began his 13th century masterpiece, The Divine Comedy, the opening stanzas of which you will hear this evening. He began it in a dark wood of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree, the opening lines of Milton's Paradise Lost, and T.S. Eliot, the greatest poem since Milton, according to Ted Hughes, began the seminal poem of the 20th century, The Wasteland, with April is the cruelest month. We're going to start this evening with love in the garden, and I can assure you that it's a lot less pastoral than you might imagine. The Sally Gardens was published in 1889 when Yeats was 24. A few months later, Maud Gone exploded into the Yeats household. And in a single afternoon, <clears throat> she took possession of his soul and of his heart. And the debate continues as to her possession or not of his body. However, it is safe to say that from that moment, he never ever took love easy, which is the theme of the Sally Gardens. After that, to another Maud. What is it about Mauds that they cause such havoc? Like Maud Gone, uh, the fictional Maud in Come Into the Garden, Maud is also tall and stately. Her lover waits all night, calling, Come into the garden, Maud, while she dances away with a more acceptable suitor. As you can imagine, this will end in tears, and it certainly does. Many believe Blake, 18th century mystic, to have been insane. Wordsworth 
agreed, but said, there is something in the madness of this man which interests me more than the sanity of Lord Byron. In the Garden of Love from Song Songs of Experience, he attacks the constraints placed by the church on sexual love, a well-known Blakeian theme, as in Songs of Innocence, where he asked, why a tender curb upon the youthful burning boy? <coughs> we then have a 10-word haiku by Oshima Ryota, and it's called, And Then. It required two eminent English poets to translate these 10 words. It was worth it because it's really stunning. And we end our Love in the Garden with a warning from the American writer Dorothy Parker of the limitations of sending the beloved one perfect rose. But first, we are going to go into the Sally Gardens. It was down by the Sally Gardens, my love and I did meet. She crossed the Sally Gardens with little snow-white feet. She bid me take love easy as the leaves grow on the trees. But I was young and foolish and with her did not agree. In a field down by the river, my love and I did stand, and on my leaning shoulder she laid her snow-white hand. She bid me take life easy, as the grass grows on the weirs. But I was young and foolish, and now am full of tears. Down by the Sally Gardens, my love and I did meet. She crossed the Sally Gardens with little snow white feet. She bid me take love easy as the leaves grow on the tree. But I was young and foolish, and with her did not agree. Come Into the Garden, Maud, by Alfred Lord Tennyson. Come into the garden, Maud, for the black bat's night has flown. Come into the garden, Maud. I am here at the gate alone. And the woodbine spices are wafted abroad. And the musk of the rose is blown. For a breeze of morning moves. And the planet of love is on high. Beginning to faint in the light that she loves on a bed of daffodil sky. To faint in the light of the sun she loves. To faint in his light and to die. All night have the roses heard the flute, violin, bassoon. All night has the casement jessamine stirred to the dancers dancing in tune. Till a silence fell with the waking bird and a hush with the setting moon. The Garden of Love by William Blake. I laid me down upon a bank where love lay sleeping. I heard among the rushes dank, weeping, weeping. Then I went to the heath and the wild, to the thistles and thorns of the waste. And they told me how they were beguiled, driven out and compelled to the chaste. I went to the garden of love and saw what I never had seen. A chapel was built in the mist where I used to play on the green. And the gates of this chapel were shut, and thou shalt not writ over the door. So I turned to the garden of love that so many sweet flowers bore. And I saw it was filled with graves and tombstones where flowers should be. And priests in black gowns were walking their rounds and binding with briars my joys and desires.
and then by Oshima Ryota. Bad tempered, I got back. Then in the garden, the willow tree. One Perfect Rose by Dorothy Parker. A single flower he sent me since we met. All tenderly his messenger he chose. Deep-hearted, pure with scented dew still wet. One perfect rose. I knew the language of the floweret. My fragile leaves, it said, his heart enclose. Love long has taken for his amulet one perfect rose. Why is it no one ever sent me yet one perfect limousine, do you suppose? Ugh, <laughs> oh, no, it's always just my luck to get one perfect rose. <laughs> Dylan Thomas follows with the great Fern Hill. Born in 1914, Swansea, the wild poet, lover and drinker who married the gloriously named Kathleen McNamara was, despite all that, a disciplined artist. There is some mythology that it was all terribly easy for him, but his worksheets show a man who continually laboured over every line. So anyone who thinks that he just rolled out of bed in a drunken haze after a night of passionate lovemaking and dashed off a masterpiece like Fern Hill, one of the greatest celebrations of a country childhood ever written, is, alas, wrong. It is one of the great celebratory poems of the countryside. Larkin wrote The Mower in 1979. It's much kinder than normal Larkin. It's clever, of course. Larkin had a pathological fear of death. That's not just my assessment, it's an actual doctor's clinical assessment. And many of his friends during that period of time had been very seriously ill. This poem is about death and the fear of death. In 1979, Larkin, Incidentally, a D.H. Lawrence fanatic, he liked to wear a T-shirt decorated with a print of Lawrence. Uh, but while he was mowing the lawn, had a nice vision. Death on the lawn. Jared Manley Hopkins, like Blake, was an ecstatic, born into a family of high Anglicans, but he became a Catholic. And like all ecstatics, wished, I think, to be a saint. He became a Jesuit and symbolically burnt his poems, but thank heavens many of them remain. His work was turned down as incomprehensible, even by Catholic journals. Eventually, his genius, his search for a unifying sacramental view of human life, so clear in the poem we're going to hear, Pied Beauty, made him one of the 19th century's great poets. And then we come to the loveliest poem ever written, John Keats's Ode to a Nightingale. Keats, who supposedly in Byron's very unkind line, died of a bad review, <laughs> was mercilessly attacked and deeply wounded by the viciousness of those who called him part of the Cockney school. It's almost unbearable to think that he died, only 25, from tuberculosis. However, like all brilliant writers, he knew. He wrote to his brother, I think I shall be among the English poets after my death. And he was so right. That we are now familiar with Marvel is almost a literary miracle. Even when his poems were published in 1681, a few years after his death, they were largely unnoticed. It was not until after the First World War 
in Grierson's biography and T.S. Eliot's essays on him that he became really well known. His oblique, ironic and enigmatic way of treating the poem was more acceptable to a modern audience. He was born out of his time. Thoughts in a Garden is one of the greatest contemplative poems ever written in which Marvel gathers up almost all of life to a green thought in a green shade. But first, we will listen to Dylan Thomas's Fern Hill. Now, as I was young and easy under the apple boughs, about the lilting house, and happy as the grass was green, the night above the dingle starry, let me hail and climb golden in the heydays of his eyes. And honoured among wagons, I was prince of the apple towns. And once below a time, I lordly had the trees and leaves trail with daisies and barley down the river of the windfall light. And as I was green and carefree, famous among the barns, about the happy yard and singing as the farm was home, in the sun that is young once only, time let me play and be golden in the mercy of his means. And green and golden, I was huntsman and herdsman. The calves sang to my horn. The foxes on the hills barked clear and cold. And the Sabbath rang slowly in the pebbles of the holy streams. All the sun long, it was running, it was lovely. The hayfields high as a house the tunes from the chimneys, it was air and playing, lovely and watery, the fire green as grass, and nightly under the simple stars, as I rode to sleep, the owls were bearing the farm away. All the moon long I heard, blessed among stables, the night jars flying with the ricks and the horses flashing into the dark. And then to wake and the farm, like a wanderer white with dew, come back the cock on his shoulder. It was all shining. It was Adam and Maiden. The sky gathered again and the sun grew round that very day. So it must have been after the birth of the simple light in the first spinning place. The spellbound horses walking warm out of the whinnying green stable onto the fields of praise. And honoured among foxes and pheasants by the gay house under the new-made clouds, and happy as the heart was long, in the sun born over and over I ran my heedless ways. My wishes raced through the house high hay, and nothing I cared at my sky-blue trades that time allows in all his tuneful turning so few and such morning songs before the children green and golden follow him out of grace. Nothing I cared in the lamb-white days that time would take me up to the swallows throng loft by the shadow of my hand in the moon that is always rising, nor that riding to sleep I should hear him fly with the high fields and wake to the farm forever fled from the childless land. 
Oh, as I was young and easy in the mercy of his means, time held me green and dying, though I sang in my chains like the sea. <coughs> the Mower by Philip Larkin. The mower stalled twice. Kneeling, I found a hedgehog jammed up against the blades, killed. It had been in the long grass. I had seen it before and even fed it once. Now I had mauled its unobtrusive world unmendably. Burial was no help. Next morning, I got up and it did not. First day after a death, the new absent is always the same. We should be careful of each other. We should be kind while there is still time. Hide Beauty by Gerard Manley Hopkins. Glory be to God for dappled things. For skies of couple colour as a brinded cow. For rose moles all in stipple upon trouts that swim. Fresh fire coal, chestnut falls, finches' wings. Landscape plotted and pieced, fold, fallow and plough. And all trades their gear and tackle and trim. All things counter, original, spare, strange. Whatever is fickle, freckled, who knows how. With swift, slow, sweet, sour, a dazzle, dim. He fathers forth, whose beauty is past change. Praise him. Ode to a Nightingale by John Keats. My heart aches and a drowsy numbness pains my sense as though of hemlock I had drunk or emptied some dull opiate to the drains one minute past, and lethar wards had sunk. Tis not through envy of thy happy lot, but being too happy in thine happiness, that thou, light-winged dryad of the trees, in some melodious plot of beech and green, and shadows numberless, singest of summer in full-throated ease. Oh, for a draught of vintage, that have been cooled a long age in the deep delved earth, tasting of flora and the country green, dance and provencal song and sunburnt mirth. Oh, for a beaker full of the warm south, full of the true, the blushful hippocrene with beaded bubbles winking at the brim and purple stained mouth that I might drink and leave the world unseen and with thee fade away into the forest dim, fade far away, dissolve and quite forget what thou among the leaves has never known, the weariness, the fever and the fret here, where men sit and hear each other groan, where palsy shakes a few sad last grey hairs, where youth grows pale and spectre thin and dies, where better think is to be full of sorrow and leaden-eyed despairs, where beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes or new love pine at them beyond tomorrow. Away, away, for I will fly to thee, not charioted by Bacchus and his pards, but on the viewless wings of poesy. Though the dull brain perplexes and retards already with thee, tender is the night, and haply the queen moon is on her throne, clustered around by all her starry fays. But here there is no light, save what from heaven is with the breezes blown through verdurous glooms and winding mossy ways. I cannot see what flowers are at my feet, nor what soft incense hangs upon the boughs, but in embalmed darkness, Guess each sweet, wherewith the seasonable month endows the grass, the thicket, and the fruit tree wild. White hawthorn, and the pastoral eglantine, fast fading violets, covered up in leaves, 
and mid May's eldest child, the coming musk rose, full of dewy wine, the murmurous haunt of flies on summer eaves. <clears throat> Darkling, I listen, and for many a time, I have been half in love with easeful death, called him soft names in a many mused rhyme, to take into the air my quiet breath. Now, more than ever, seems it rich to die, to cease upon the midnight with no pain, while thou art pouring forth thy soul abroad in such an ecstasy. Still wouldst thou sing, and I have ears in vain, to thy high requiem become a sod. Thou wast not born for death, immortal bird. No hungry generations tread thee down. The voice I hear this passing night was heard in ancient days by emperor and clown. Perhaps the selfsame song that found a path through the sad heart of Ruth, when sick for home she stood in tears amid the alien corn, the same that oft times hath charmed magic casements, opening on the foam of perilous seas in fairy lands forlorn. Forlorn. The very word is like a bell to toll me back from thee to my soul self. Adieu. The fancy cannot cheat so well as she is fain to do, deceiving elf. Adieu. Adieu. Thy plaintive anthem fades past the near meadows, over the still stream, up the hillside, and now tis buried deep in the next valley glades. Was it a vision or a waking dream? Fled is that music. Do I wake or sleep? Thoughts in a Garden by Andrew Marvel. How vainly men themselves amaze to win the palm, the oak, or bays, and their incessant labours see crowned from some single herb or tree, whose short and narrow verge shade does prudently their toils upbraid, while all the flowers and trees do close to weave the garlands of repose. Fair quiet have I found thee here, and innocence thy sister dear, Mistaken long, I sought you then in busy companies of men. Your sacred plants, if here below, only among the plants will grow. Society is all but rude to this delicious solitude. No white nor red was ever seen so amorous as this lovely green. Fond lovers, cruel as their flame, cut in these trees their mistress's name. Little alas, they know or heed how far these beauties hers exceed. Fair trees, where's e'er your barks I wound, no name shall but your own be found. When we have run our passion's heat, love hither makes his best retreat. The gods that mortal beauty chase, still in a tree did end their race. Apollo hunted Daphne so only that she might laurel grow. And Pan did after searing speed, not as a nymph, but for a reed. What wondrous life in this I lead. Ripe apples drop about my head. The luscious clusters of the vine upon my mouth do crush their wine. The nectarine and curious peach into my hands themselves do reach. Stumbling on melons as I pass, ensnared with flowers, I fall on grass. Meanwhile, the mind from pleasure less withdraws into its happiness. The mind, that ocean where each kind does straight its own resemblance find. Yet it creates, transcending these far other worlds and other seas, annihilating all that's made to a green thought in a green shade. Here at the fountain's sliding foot, or at some fruit tree's mossy root, casting the body's vest aside, my soul into the boughs does glide. There, like a bird, it sits and sings, then wets and combs its silver wings, and, till prepared for longer flight, waves in its plumes the various light. 
Such was that happy garden state, while man there walked without a mate. <coughs> After a place so pure and sweet, what other help could yet be meet? But t'was beyond a mortal's share to wander solitary there. Two paradises twere in one to live in paradise alone. How well the skilful gardener drew of flowers and herbs this dial knew, where from above the milder sun does through a fragrant zodiac run, and as it works the industrious bee computes its time as well as we. How could such sweet and wholesome hours be reckoned but with herbs and flowers? Our next section is Gardens of the Imagination. <coughs> the first poem is one of the most mysterious poems that Eliot ever wrote, and it has baffled readers for years. It's called Usk. And when we talk of the white heart in this, we're not talking about this heart. We're talking about the male deer. What is the white heart over the white well? What exactly does he mean by gently dip, but not too deep? It's a very haunting poem. Up next is the only personal poem that Eliot ever wrote, and it's called Dedication to My Wife. It speaks of the imaginary rose garden in which perhaps we would all wish to live. Its last line is particularly moving. Then we have another poem of the imagination by Edward Thomas entitled, For These. Edward Thomas's poem is a garden of hope, but fate wasn't kind to Edward Thomas. He was killed at Arras and much of his work was published posthumously. In a text called The Strange Death of Edward Thomas, they recount the following. The Germans were in retreat and the British soldiers were shouting and dancing, almost believing that they'd won the war when Second Lieutenant Edward Thomas stepped out of the dugout as the Germans fired one last shell. It missed him, but came so close, the blast of air stopped his heart. There was not the slightest sign of injury. Then we go to the Song of Wandering Angus, an early Yeats poem set in a hazel wood, a kind of surrealist poem. And Joyce said, very cleverly of Yeats, that he had an imagination no surrealist painter could ever equal. And this is one of the poems which illustrates this brilliantly. And we end this section with Kubla Khan, written by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Charles Lamb described him as an archangel slightly damaged. <laughs> now here we do have the masterpiece dreamed in an opium dream, but it was dreamed as a 300-line poem, but Samuel Taylor Coleridge was famously interrupted by a person from Porlock, and only 54 lines remained in his memory. But what lines they are. As long as poetry is read or listened to, it will delight and thrill us all. <coughs> but first, to usk by T. S. Eliot. Do not suddenly break the branch or hope to find the white heart over the white well. Glance aside, not for lance. Do not spell old enchantments. Let them sleep. Gently dip, but not too deep. Lift your eyes where the roads dip and where the roads rise. Seek only there, where the grey light meets the green air, the hermit's chapel, the pilgrim's prayer. Uh, 
a dedication to my wife by <coughs> T.S. Eliot. To whom I owe the leaping delight that quickens my senses in our waking time and the rhythm that governs the repose of our sleeping time, the breathing in unison, of lovers whose bodies smell of each other, who think the same thoughts without need of speech and babble the same speech without need of meaning, no peevish winter wind shall chill, no sullen tropic sun shall wither the rose in the rose garden which is ours and ours only. But this dedication is for others to read. These are private words addressed to you in public. For These, by Edward Thomas. An acre of land between the shore and the hills, upon a ledge that shows my kingdoms three, the lovely visible earth and sky and sea where what's the curl you needs not, the farmer tills. A house that shall love me as I love it, well hedged, and honoured by a few ash trees that linnets, green finches and goldfinches shall often visit and make love in and flit. A garden I need never go beyond, broken but neat, whose sunflowers every one are fit to be the sign of the rising sun. A spring a brook's bend, or at least a pond. For these I ask not, but neither too late nor yet too early for what men call content, and also that something may be sent to be contented with. I ask of fate. <coughs> the Song of the Wandering Angus by W.B. Yeats. I went out to the hazel wood because a fire was in my head and cut and peeled a hazel wand and hooked a berry to a thread and when white moths were on the wing and moth-like stars were flickering out I dropped the berry in a stream and caught a little silver trout when I had laid it on the floor, I went to blow the fire of flame, but something rustled on the floor, and someone called me by my name. It had become a glimmering girl with apple blossom in her hair, who called me by my name and ran and faded through the brightening air. Though I am old with wandering through hollow lands and hilly lands, I will find out where she has gone and kiss her lips and take her hands and walk among long dappled grass and pluck till time and times are done, the silver apples of the moon, the golden apples of the sun. Kubla Khan by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. In Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree, where Alf, the sacred river, ran through caverns measureless to man, down to a sunless sea. So twice five miles of fertile ground with walls and towers were girdled round, and there were gardens bright with sinuous rills where blossomed many an incense-bearing tree. And here were forests ancient as the hills, enfolding sunny spots of greenery. 
But oh, that deep romantic chasm which slanted down the green hill athwart a cedarn cover, a savage place, as holy and enchanted as e'er beneath a waning moon was haunted by woman wailing for her demon lover. And from this chasm, with ceaseless turmoil seething, as if this earth in fast thick pants were breathing, a mighty fountain momently was forced, amid whose swift, half intermitted burst huge fragments vaulted like rebounding hail or chaffy grain beneath the thresher's flail. And mid these dancing rocks at once and ever it flung up momently the sacred river. Five miles, meandering with a mazy motion through wood and dale, the sacred river ran, then reached the caverns measureless to man, and sank in tumult to a lifeless ocean. And mid this tumult, Kubla heard from far ancestral voices prophesying war. The shadow of the dome of pleasure floated midway on the waves, where was heard the mingled measure from the fountain and the caves. It was a miracle of rare device, a sunny pleasure dome with caves of ice. A damsel with a dulcimer in a vision once I saw. It was an Abyssinian maid, and on her dulcimer she played, singing of Mount Abora. Could I revive within me her symphony and song to such a deep delight t'would win me that with music loud and long I would build that dome in air, that sunny dome, those caves of ice, and all who heard should see them there, and all should cry, beware, beware his flashing eyes, his floating hair, weave a circle round him thrice, and close your eyes with holy dread, for he on honey dew hath fed, and drunk the milk of paradise. In this next section, we're going to take a walk through the woods. There's a very short poem by Goethe, the great genius of German culture. Poet, playwright, scientist, botanist, the wisest of our time, as Carlyle described him. This short poem, eight lines in total, in which a flower talks to him and says, why are you going to kill me? And he decides not to, and he takes it out by the root and takes it home. This little poem is a gem. It reminds me of what I consider the best description of the tragedy of Hamlet, which is Goethe's description. A great task placed upon a soul unequal to the performance of it, like an oak tree planted in a costly vase. The roots spread out, the vase shivers into pieces. And next, the trees, again, a gentler larkin with the lovely line, begin afresh, afresh, afresh. And then we have the first middle-aged male crisis, Dante. <laughs> Dante made the spiritual visible, according to Eliot. The Divine Comedy, the 14th century poem, the opening lines of which you will hear shortly, written in 1307, is probably the first literary examination of the middle-aged crisis which leads, as these things often do, to hell. <laughs> and then we have The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost, also finds himself perplexed in a wood. It's, it's an evocative <laughs> poem that illustrates life's choices and how they are very often irrevocable. And then to Rupert Brooks, The Soldier, in 1915, Winston Churchill wrote, Rupert Brooke is dead. His life has closed at the moment when it seemed to have reached its springtime. Only the echoes and the memory remain, but they will linger. He was right. Well, 
there is a corner of so many green fields where British soldiers lie all over Europe. But first to Found. Found by Goethe. Once through the forest, alone I went, to seek for nothing, my thoughts were bent. <coughs> I saw in the shadow a flower stand there, as stars it glistened, as eyes t'was fair. I sought to pluck it, it gently said, shall I be gathered only to fade? With all its roots I dug it with care and took it home to my garden fair. In silent corner soon it was set, there grows it ever, there blooms it yet. The Trees by Philip Larkin the trees are coming into leaf, like something almost being said. The recent buds relax and spread. Their greenness is a kind of grief. Is it that they are born again and we grow old? No, they die too. Their yearly trick of looking new is written down in rings of grain. Yet still the unresting castles thresh in full-grown thickness every May. Last year is dead, they seem to say. Begin afresh, afresh, afresh. Canto one of Dante's Divine Comedy. <clears throat> Midway this way of life we're bound upon, I woke to find myself in a dark wood where the right road was wholly lost and gone. Ah oh, me, how hard to speak of it, that rude and rough and stubborn forest. The mere breath of memory stirs the old fear in the blood. It was so bitter, it goes nigh to death. And yet there I gain such good that to convey the tale, I'll write what else I found therewith. How I got into it, I cannot say, because I was so heavy and full of sleep when first I stumbled from the narrow way. But when, at last, I stood beneath a steep hillside which closed that valley's wandering maze, whose dread had pierced me to the heart root deep, then I looked up and saw the morning rays mantle its shoulder from that planet bright which guides men's feet aright on all their ways. And this a little quieted the affright that lurking in my bosoms had lain through the long horror of that piteous night. The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveller. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as fair and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as for that, the passing there had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay, in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh. Somewhere 
ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I. I took the one less travelled by, and that has made all the difference. The Soldier by Rupert Brooke. If I should die, think only this of me, that there's some corner of a foreign field that is forever England. There shall be in that rich earth a richer dust concealed, a dust whom England bore, shaped, made aware, gave once her flowers to love, her ways to roam, a body of England's, breathing English air, washed by the rivers, blessed by sons of home. And think, this heart, all evil shed away, a pulse in the eternal mind, no less, gives somewhere back the thoughts by England given, her sights and sounds, dreams happy as her day, and laughter, Learn to friends and gentleness in hearts at peace under an English heaven. We're now going to take a short section from Paradise Lost by Milton. Paradise Lost was actually going to be a play and it was going to be called Adam Unparadised. Critics say that Milton changed his mind because he realised the weight of Shakespeare was such that instead of trying to compete, he would write a great long epic poem. Milton's purpose, stated in Book One, is to justify the ways of God to men. And as Goethe wrote once, the devil is God's best excuse. Milton was a sect, if you like, of his own. He makes you feel that he was puritanical or misogynistic, but that's not true. He fought very hard for divorce, and he believed in sexual intercourse before marriage, which uh, in his time made him notorious. In the section we're going to hear, Satan has already persuaded Eve that she must eat of the fruit. She knows she shouldn't. She's been told she shouldn't. But she does. And after she's eaten it and has now knowledge, she thinks to herself, now, why should I share the knowledge with Adam? Wouldn't it be kind of nice to keep it to myself and just for once be the superior being? But eventually she goes off to Adam and she tries to persuade him. The minute he sees her, he knows what she's done and she's doomed. And in a rather moving passage, he resolves to join her in this doom. Flesh of flesh, bone of my bone thou art, and from thy state mine never shall be parted. He eats the fruit, and then comes the beautiful line, some sad drops wept at completing of the mortal sin original, which is the first great sin. Immediately, carnal desire inflames him, and Eve responds, and Milton says, in lust they burn. They're off to a shady bank in the garden, which he beautifully describes. <laughs> uh, this first sexual encounter leads to the first post-coital guilt, which leads to the first post-coital blame game and row in which Adam berates her if only you'd listen to me. The row continues on as indeed they do. The rows continue on as they do for eternity. And when we leave them, they're in the male-female row that continues to this day. So we join Eve in the garden and she has eaten the fruit. But to Adam, in what sort shall I appear? Shall I to him make known as yet my change, and give him to partake full happiness with me, or rather not, but keep the odds of knowledge in my power without co-partner, 
So to add what once in female sex, the more to draw his love and render me more equal. And perhaps, a thing not undesirable, sometime superior for inferior, who is free? This may be well, but what if God have seen and death ensue? Then I shall be no more, and Adam, wedded to another Eve, shall live with her enjoying. I extinct. A death to think, confirmed then I resolve, Adam shall share with me in bliss or woe. So dear I love him, that with him all deaths I could endure. Without him live no life. So saying, from the tree her step she turned, but first low reverence done, as to the power that dwelt within whose presence had infused into the plant sciential sap derived from nectar, drink of gods. Adam the while, waiting desirous of her return, had wove of choicest flowers a garland to adorn her tresses, and her rural labor, labor's crown, as reapers often are wont their harvest queen. Great joy he promised to his thoughts, and new solace in her return, so long delayed. Yet oft his heart, divine of something ill, misgave him, he the faltering measure felt, and forth to meet her went, the way she took that morn when first they parted, by the tree of knowledge he must pass, and there he her met scarce from the tree returning. In her hand, a bough of fairest fruit that downy smiled, new gathered and ambrosial smell diffused. To him she hasted, in her face excuse, came prologue and apology to prompt, which with bland words at will, she thus addressed. Hast thou not wondered? Adam, at my stay. Thee I have missed and thought it long, deprived thy presence. Agony of love till now not felt, nor shall be twice, for never more mean I to try what rash I untried I sought, the pain of absence from thy sight. But strange hath been the cause, and wonderful to hear. This tree is not as we are told. A tree of danger tasted, nor to evil unknown are opening the way, but of divine effect, to open eyes and make them gods who taste, and hath been tasted such. The serpent wise, or not restrained as we, or not obeying, hath eaten of the fruit, and is become not dead as we are threatened, but thenceforth endued with human voice and human, human sense, reasoning to admiration, and with me persuasively hath so prevailed that I have also tasted and have also found the effects to correspond. Opener mine eyes, dimmest dilated spirits, ampler heart and growing up to Godhead, which for thee chiefly I sought, without thee, can despise, for bliss as thou hast part to me is bliss, tedious unshared with thee, and odious soon. Thou therefore also taste, that equal lot may join us, equal love, equal joy as equal love. Least thou not tasting, different degree disjoin us, and I then too late renounce deity for thee, when fate will not permit. Thus Eve, with countenance blithe, her story told, but in her cheek distemper flushing glowed. On the other side, Adam, soon as he heard the fatal trespass done by Eve, amazed, astonished stood and blank, while horror chill ran through his veins and all his joints relaxed. From his slack hand the garland wreathed for Eve down dropped, and all the faded roses shed. Speechless he stood, and pale, till thus at length, 
First to himself he inward silence broke. O oh, fairest of creation, last and best of all God's works, creature in whom excelled, whatever can to fight or thought be found, holy, divine, good, amiable, or sweet, how art thou lost, how on a sudden lost, defaced, deflowered, and now to death devote, Rather, how hast thou yielded to transgress the strict forbiddance? How to violate the sacred fruit forbidden? Some cursed fraud of enemy hath beguiled thee, yet unknown, and me with thee hath ruined. For with thee certain my resolution is to die. How can I live without thee? How forego thy sweet converse and love so dearly joined to live again in these wild woods forlorn? Should God create another Eve, and I another rib afford, yet loss of thee would never from my heart, no, no. I feel the link of nature draw me, flesh of flesh, bone of my bone thou art, and from thy state mine never shall be parted, bliss or woe. So having said, as one from sad dismay recomforted, and after thoughts disturbed, submitting to what seemed remediless, thus in, ca <coughs> in calm mood, his words to Eve he turned. Bold deed thou hast presumed, adventurous Eve, and peril great provoked. Who thus has dared, had it been only coveting to eye, that sacred fruit, sacred to abstinence, much more to taste it under ban to touch. But past, who can recall or done undo? Not God omnipotent for fate, yet so perhaps thou shalt not die. Perhaps the fact is not so heinous now, foretasted fruit, profaned first by the serpent, by him first made common and unhallowed, ere one tastes nor yet on him found deadly, he yet lives, lives as thou saidst, and gains to live as man, higher degree of life, inducement strong to us, as likely tasting to attain proportional assent, which cannot be but to be gods, or angels, demigods. Nor can I think that God, creator-wise, though threatening, will in earnest so destroy us, his prime creatures, dignified so high, set over all his works, which in our fall, for us created, needs with us, must fail, dependent, made. So God shall uncreate, be frustrate, do, undo, and labour lose, not well conceived of God, who though his power creation could repeat, yet would be loath us to abolish, lest the adversary triumph and say, fickle their state whom God most favours, who can please him long? Me first he ruined, now mankind, whom will he next? Matter of scorn, not to be given the foe. However, I, with thee, have fixed my lot, certain to undergo like doom if death consort with thee. Death is to me as life. So forcible within my heart, I feel the bond of nature draw me to my own. My own in thee. For what thou art is mine. Our state cannot be severed. We are one, one flesh. To lose thee were to lose myself. So, Adam. And thus, Eve to him replied. O oh, glorious trial of exceeding love, illustrious evidence, example high, engaging me to emulate, but short, of thy perfection. How shall I attain, Adam, from whose dear side I boast me sprung, and gladly of our union hear thee speak? One heart, one soul in both, whereof good proof this day affords, declaring thee resolved, rather than death, or aught than death more dread, shall separate us, linked in love so dear, to undergo with me one guilt, one crime, if any be, of tasting this fair fruit whose virtue for of good still good proceeds, direct or by occasion hath presented this happy trial of thy love, 
which else so eminently never had been known. Were it, I thought, death, menaced would ensue this my attempt, I would sustain alone the worst, and not persuade thee, rather die deserted than oblige thee with a fact pernicious to thy peace, chiefly assured, remarkably so late of thy so true, so faithful love unequalled. But I feel far otherwise the event, not death, but life augmented, opened eyes, new hopes, new joys, taste so divine that what of sweet before hath touched my sense. Flat seems to this, and harsh. On my experience, Adam, freely taste, and fear of death deliver to the winds. So saying, she embraced him, and for joy tenderly wept. Much one that he his love had so ennobled as of choice to incur divine displeasure for her sake or death. In recompense, for such compliance bad, such recompense best merits, from the bough she gave him of that fair enticing fruit with liberal hand. He scrupled not to eat, against his better knowledge, not deceived, but fondly overcome with female charm. Earth trembled from her entrails, as again in pangs, and nature gave a second groan, sky lowered and muttering thunder, some sad drops wept at completing of the mortal sin original. While Adam took no thought, eating his fill, nor Eve to iterate her former trespass feared, the more to soothe him with her loved society, that now, as with new wine intoxicated both, they swim in mirth and fancy that they feel divinity within them, breeding wings wherewith to scorn the earth. But that false fruit, far other operation first displayed, carnal desire inflaming, he on Eve began to cast lascivious eyes, she him, as wantonly repaid, in lust they burn, till Adam thus can Eve to dalliance move. Eve, now I see thou art exact of taste and elegant of sapience, no small part, since to each meaning savour we apply and palate call judicious. I, the praise, yield thee. So well this day thou hast pervaded. Much pleasure we have lost while we abstained from this delightful fruit, nor known till now true relish tasting, if such pleasure be in things to us forbidden. It might be wished for this one tree had been forbidden ten. But come, so well refreshed, now let us play, as meat is after such delicious fare. For never did thy beauty since the day I saw thee first and wedded thee, adorned with all perfection, so inflame my sense with ardour to enjoy thee. Fairer now than ever, bounty of this virtuous tree. So said he, and forbore not glance or toy of amorous intent, well understood of Eve whose eye darted contagious fire. Her hand she, he seized, and to a shady bank, thick overhead with verdant roof embowered, he led her nothing loath. Flowers were the couch, pansies and violets and asphodel and hyacinths, earth's freshest, softest lap. There, they their fill of love and love's disport, took largely of their mutual guilt the seal, the solace of their sin, till dewy sleep oppressed them, 
wearied with their amorous play. Soon as the force of that fallacious fruit that with exhilarating vapour bland about their spirits had played and inmost powers made err, was now exhaled. And grosser sleep, bred of unkindly fumes, with conscious dreams encumbered, now had left them. Up they rose as from unrest. And each, the other viewing, soon found their eyes how opened, and their minds how darkened. Innocence, that as a veil had shadowed them from knowing ill, was gone. Just confidence and native righteousness, and honour from them, from about them, naked left. To guilty shame he covered, but his robe uncovered more. So rose the Danite strong Herculean Samson from the harlot lap of Philistine Delilah, and waked shorn of his strength. They, destitute and bare of all their virtue, silent and in face confounded long they sat as struck and mute, till Adam, though not less than Eve abashed, at length gave utterance to these words constrained. O oh, Eve, in evil hour thou didst give care to that false worm, of whomsoever taught to counterfeit man's voice, true in our fall, false in our promised rising. Since our eyes opened, we find indeed, and find we know, both good and evil, good lost, and evil got, bad fruit of knowledge. If this be to know, which leaves us naked thus, of honour void, of innocence, of faith, of purity, our wanted ornaments now soiled and stained, and in our faces evident the signs of foul concupiscence, Whence evil store, even shame, the last of evils, of the first be sure then. How shall I behold the face henceforth of God, or angel, erst with joy and rapture so oft beheld? Those heavenly shapes will dazzle now this earthly, with their blaze insufferably bright. Oh, might I here in solitude live savage, in some glade obscured, where highest woods impenetrable to star or sunlight spread their umbrage broad and brown as evening. Cover me, ye pines, ye cedars with innumerable boughs. Hide me, where I may never see them more. But let us now, as in bad plight, devise what best may for the present serve to hide the parts of each from other that seem most to shame obnoxious and unseemliest seen. Some tree whose broad, smooth leaves, together sewed and girded on our loins, may cover round those middle parts, that this newcomer, shame, there sit not, and reproach us as unclean. So counselled he, and both together went into the thickest wood. There soon they chose the fig tree. Those leaves they gathered broad as Amazonian targe, and with what skill they had together sewed to gird their waist. Vain covering if to hide their guilt and dreaded shame. Oh, how unlike to that first naked glory. Such of late Columbus found the American to girt with fettered cincture, naked else and wild, among the trees on isles and woody shores. Thus fenced, as though they thought their shame in part covered, but not at rest or ease of mind, they sat them down to weep. Nor only tears rained at their eyes, but high winds worse within began to rise. High passions, anger, hate, mistrust, suspicion, discord, and shook sore their inward state of mind, calm region once 
and full of peace, now tossed and turbulent, for understanding ruled not, and the will heard not her law, both in subjection now to sensual appetite, who from beneath, usurping over sovereign reason, claimed superior sway. From thus distempered breast, Adam, estranged in look and altered style, speech, intermitted thus to Eve renewed. Would thou hadst hearkened to my words and stayed with me as I besought thee when that strange desire of wandering this unhappy morn I know not whence possessed thee. We had then remained still happy, not as now, despoiled of all our good, shamed, naked, miserable. Let none henceforth seek needless cause to approve the faith they owe. When earnestly they seek such proof, conclude, then they begin to fail. To whom, soon moved with touch of blame, thus Eve. What words have passed thy lips, Adam Severe? Inputs thou that to my default, or will of wandering, as thou call'st it, which who knows might as ill have happened thou being by, or to thyself, perhaps, hadst thou been there, or bear the attempt thou could not have discerned fraud in the serpent, speaking as he spake. No ground of enmity between us known, why he should mean me ill or seek to harm. Was I to have never parted from thy side? As good have grown there still a liveless rib, being as I am, why didst not thou, the head, command me absolutely not to go? Going into such danger, as thou saidst, too facile, then thou didst not much gainsay. Nay, didst permit, approve, and fair dismiss, hadst thou been firm and fixed in thy descent, neither had I transgressed nor thou with me. To whom the then first incensed Adam replied, Ah, uh, is this the love? Is this the recompense of mine to thee, ingrateful Eve, expressed immutable when thou wert lost? Not I, who might have lived and enjoyed immortal bliss, yet willingly chose rather death with thee, and am I now upbraided as the cause of thy transgressing? Not enough severe, it seems, in thy restraint. What could I more? I warned thee, I admonished thee, foretold the danger and the lurking enemy that lay in wait. Beyond this had been force, and force upon free will hath here no place. But confidence then bore thee on, secure either to meet no danger or to find matter of glorious trial, and perhaps I also erred in overmuch admiring what seemed in thee so perfect that I thought no evil durst attempt thee, but I rue that error now, which is become my crime, and thou the accuser. Thus it shall befall him, who to worth in women over-trusting lets her will rule, restraint she will not brook, and left to herself, if evil vents ensue, she first his weak indulgence will accuse. Thus they, in mutual accusation, spent the fruitless hours, but neither self-condemning. And of their vain contest appeared no end. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.